fintech disruption. Yes. Forget her award. Think about how it could be. A new mindset has arrived. Where to share has become our greatest power. It is this energy that guides us, will enlighten us. Where meaning and purpose is a plane. Burn inside every soul on the planet. Welcome to the human to human model. Uniting and inspiring leaders globally. To build together with meaningfulness and joy. Opening new possibilities for people. Anticipating disruption. Rethinking society. Fully reach their potential because the future is today. Join us to be sustainable plus 112. <laughs> And I think right now is clearly the way to act. Lack of clean energy will affect the Earth's core later. I find that when people begin making small changes, they gradually get bigger because they get this feeling, I am doing something. So we move from... Oh. Okay. Let's see. Making money is a happiness. Making other people happy is a super happiness. Wondering about your future? So bring your DNA to us today. One, actually, person who is one of the biggest disruptors, yes? When you are a dreamer, when you are a visionary, of course, you have your vision, but there are moments that sometimes maybe you stop believing in this vision, especially in the moments of uh, some problems or failure. So could you tell me, and could you tell also to thousands of people who maybe will be motivated by your answer, what keeps you fighting for your vision? What helps you to reach your dream? Well, I mean, I, I think I'm kind of constitutionally just geared to, to just keep going. I don't know. Um, it's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it just, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it certainly, it, there are times when, you know, things don't go well and then, uh, that's quite dispiriting for sure. Um, and so then it's, it's difficult to proceed with the same level of enthusiasm. Um, but um, but I do think like, I do think the things that we're doing are, are, you know, pretty important to the future. Um, and if we don't succeed, then, you know, there's, well, there's, there's not, it's not clear what other things would succeed. Um, and if, if we don't succeed, then we will be certainly pointed to as a reason why people shouldn't even try for these things. So, uh, I think it's important that we do whatever is necessary to keep going. So thank you, and I wish you that your next birthday is very successful. Thanks. Thank you so much. Actually, I it was our dream, not this conference. I yes, think, you know. yes, it was. So maybe we get started with our session, uh, Tomas. I would like to open the session convergence of clean tech with other disruptions. And uh, before we get started, let's make a very brief introduction of who is here with us today. Uh, my name is Eike Weber. I'm the chair of the European Solar Manufacturing Council. Before I was uh, uh, director of the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems. And as a matter of fact, as the first person, I want to introduce Andre Langwurst, who is our co-chair from the uh, Cleantech Business Club. Uh, Andre, if you want to introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much, Eike. So my name is Andre Langwurst. I'm a French-German lawyer, basically involved in renewable energy and energy efficiency projects for the last something like 20 years. Um, and well, 
like I said, uh, I've been recently elected uh, General Secretary for European Solar Manufacturing Council. That is an objective uh, what I, I do some uh, following for the last couple of years um, uh, for for some European uh, manufacturing uh, uh, because like you know there's been lots of uh, research in, in uh, ongoing in, in Europe uh, but all the protection facilities are right now out so I think it's good if we have a, as well a kind of local production and then I'm as well uh, chair of Eurosolar France, and this I think is as well a good opportunity to, to remember Hermann Scher, who died something like 10 years ago, and uh, he was really one of the front runners together with Hans Josef Fell for the re renewable energy movement. So, thank you very much as well, Thomas, for organizing everything. And I should appreciate Andre because he has done behind the scene lots of important networking and uh, activities to get our program together. And now we, we come for that. <laughs> yes, and we come to our panelists. Uh, Roger, I would like to start with you. Hey, I am Roger Norman. I am uh, 47, member of the Swiss uh, Parliament. I was elected 2004. And uh, since my election, I am in the Energy and the Environment Committee. And I am uh, also now, uh, by, since five years, head of the Social Democrat uh, Group in the Swiss Parliament. Uh, and also president of Swiss Solar. Swiss Solar is the Swiss Business Federation of Solar Energy, uh, also Solar Eat and the Solar Ar Architecture. Um, and I am also in the board of the Swiss Clean Tech Association, which is far broader. So, and I just wrote two books, and I, I will present a short abstract of this of the last one. Great to have you with uh, us. So, I remember uh, that we are cooperating when I was working at EPIA. Couple of oh, yes. <laughs> Actually, Thomas, from your time at EPI, you got all your connections, right? <laughs> but we never met each other, but we see thanks to uh, okay. Zoom, we can at least see. Yes. Them. And now we jump all the way down to Australia. Andrew, it's great to have you with us. Hi, my name is Andrew Blake. I'm a professor of engineering at the Australian National University. I've been involved in solar photovoltaics for about 40 years. Um, I'm, a, I'm one of the two co-inventors of the PERC cell, which is um, dominating global production at the moment. In recent years, I've turned my attention much more strongly towards 100% renewable energy futures um, because Australia, it's happening faster than most places around the world. So it's a, it's a great time to be uh, in PV and it's great to see such a growth in the industry since I came into the industry in 1979. Great to have you with us, Andrew. We go from here to uh, Tolga Murat Özdemir from Contec. Oh, oh he's, not. he's not with us. Okay. Well, we are trying to reach him, but uh, he's not picking up the phone. But uh, Gemma is here, of course. Well, we have Alexi and... Uh... So then Alexi, please go ahead. Um. Hello again, everyone. So my name is Alexei Shadrin, and um, I originally come from the impact investment space, uh, developing climate project. One of my organizations is uh, the Russian Carbon Fund, which is, exists since 2011. And in 2016, we began to uh, make R&D in terms of um, climate finance, impact investment, and digital disrupting technologies such as blockchain, uh, IoT, and AI. And we did, it, did a lot of interesting things there. And now we are bringing this to a new level, helping um, such impact investment sectors like energy and agriculture uh, to be more transparent and to uh, attract uh, finance more efficiently and uh, measure the impact outcomes of, of, of these projects. Very good. And I guess uh, we all agree that within the clean tech area, there are many, many opportunities for very interesting investments. So to kick off our session, uh, I saw a presentation that Tomas gave in Korea. And I said, when we make a session on the convergence of clean tech with other disruptions, why don't we start with your slides? And uh, uh, Tomas was so kind to share them. I made a little bit of a selection. Uh, I push now share screen and uh, Tomas, can you enable me to share the screen? You must be a co-host. Tomas? Yes, we are able. Okay. 
you have this, ah yeah, okay, here we come. Okay, let me see. It should work right now. Let's see. Ah, but now, now I can. Do oh. you see now, do you see it now? One second, I can, because we have, can you give me back rights? Because we have, we have uh, another. You don't, you don't see my screen? Do you see my screen or not? No, no. we don't. Oh, something went wrong. Oh my God. Okay, one second. So. Thomas, Torga is now connected. Can, can you connect him? Upgrade now, as a panelist? Now I gave the rights, my rights to Ike, so only Ike can. Okay. Ah, so he should be now on, on uh, visible for me to be connected. Yes, uh, you should see in the participants, uh, Todi. And now uh, I, I switched the screen. So maybe, I don't know, what should I do? Uh, now I have maybe to after the back. presentation, you yes. me, let, give let me, me the right back and we add the other participant. Exactly right. I think otherwise we, uh, so let me see here. Here we get the full screen. So, okay, now you should see it in all beauty. Is that right? Yes. Is that the where is the car screen? This is of course uh, Tony Zeba's presentation, which I heard as well the first time, 2014. Uh, Tony shows this picture from the year 1900 in New York City. I think it was on a special White Sunday holiday, and uh, you see lots of transportation, but everything driven by horses. And if you look very, very carefully, the red circle shows that in 1900, yes, there was one car on the street. And just 10 years later, in 1913, uh, same Fifth Avenue, and everything is still covered with uh, uh, mobile uh, carriages, but of course, these are all cars. And if you look very carefully, you see there is a horse. So this is really what means a disruption. You know, within 10 years, a complete change over from uh, what was before, uh, which was the horse-driven economy, uh, to the cars, making uh, things, uh, uh, many, many of the things uh, through such a disruption obsolete, going from innovation to uh, implementation to disruption. In 1898, this is how mobility looked like, actually. But, uh, this is the first, anything. this is Sorry. the first, this is an electric car. So actually around the turn of the century, there was a fierce competition between electric cars and fuel driven cars because the availability of oil just started at that time and therefore uh, many people thought that electric cars will take over but it didn't happen and this is where we are today of course we have developed enormously but the big disruption happened within this uh, 10 years about between 1900 and 1910 and we have many other examples of these disruptions. Remember the good old Walkman and uh, the tape cassettes uh, changed uh, to CDs. And who would have imagined that CDs become so quickly obsolete because everything now is streaming and is getting things directly out of the uh, 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 net. And you know, many companies have not recognized what is coming up to them. Uh, in addition to this, I would like to add the company uh, Xerox. Xerox had in the Palo Alto labs the whole development of okay, personal me. computers. Uh, okay. uh, please, uh, I don't know if other participants can see uh, the slides are changing because on my screen is always yeah. the first slide. First oh, slide. I, I have now the slide with Sony. Why? This is the, the, why the, the slides are not changing for you. I am clicking here. Which slide do you have? The first, first one. Oh, it never went further. No. Nope. Sharing is paused. Please bring shared, resume sharing. Oh my God, thank you that you told me. I'm very sorry. Is it now better? Mm -hmm. so, it's still the same. Sharing is paused. Nine, what means sharing is 19, paused? 0, 0. Resume sharing, and one second. Okay, now I get share screen. And I go again to Acrobat. Oh, maybe I do it the other way around. Let me see if this is better. I'm so sorry. 
Olga is still waiting. So do you oh. see now the slide innovation? Well, now we don't see any slide. But if no, you, you don't. Uh, if you give me lights, I can, uh, but you used uh, all the slides or? No, no, I, I can send you the set, of course. Uh, I wonder why it doesn't want to work. One second. I come out again. Okay. So I can send you the slides uh, by email. One second. And and Thomas, if, if you could please um, bring it, Toby. I cannot actually because uh, I gave. Ah, I I first have to give you the host rights. So what do okay. I have to do to give you the host rights, uh, so Thomas? You click on my on me, and click then on, on the right side side. Ah, uh, like a host okay. Host. And it should okay. be like okay. make, make host. Yes, got it. Okay, and in the meanwhile, I will send you the slides. <laughs> you are host now. Yes, yes. So we are learning a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So let it... <clears throat> my voice is becoming low. Dimitri, I could. Hi, Tony. Hi, this is Tolga from Turkey. Hello, good to have you with Hello. us. Thank you, thank you. Please keep going. I will introduce myself later on when you allow me. Actually, you might use this time to introduce yourself okay. because we are just now All right. sending okay. the slides. Then you deal with that. I, I'll follow. Uh, th this is Tolga Murat Özdemir from Turkey. Uh, I, I'm driving an investor company in solar business uh, called Contec, uh, which is uh, has just celebrated 25th years of anniversary. Uh, we are uh, acting in solar business uh, either as an investor or as an EPC and have just reached the 150 megawatt in installation and investment. Uh, parallel to this uh, activity, I'm also representing a solar association uh, uh, called Ganset. I am the vice president of that company. Uh, I think we will talk about the uh, content of the uh, uh, panel later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'm happy to have you with us. Uh, I'm just now in the process of sending Tomasz my slides. Somehow the computer is very slow. I don't recognize why. So convergence of the yes. doesn't work. <laughs> Do you know, Tomasz, what happened? Because it started to share the screen correctly and then it didn't uh, progress from there. So something maybe it's stopped okay. it, yeah. But maybe while, while you are sending, maybe we can uh, ask Roger to present his slides. How do you think, Roger? Actually, this is a good idea. Roger, why don't you go ahead? I hope, uh, let's see if slide sharing works in your case. Uh, but in this case, uh, you are muted. <laughs> Somebody has a lovely dog. Uh, I have the rights now. I will give you now. You give me the rights. Yeah. And I will mute uh, Turkey because there are some dogs uh, helping us. <laughs> ah, it's okay. I have the rights. Yes, Fine. Yes. So, do you see my uh, do you see my uh, my screen? Yes. It's okay, it works. And now, um, so hello everybody. Thanks for, for the, the invitation. I was asked to present my uh, solar plan for climate for Switzerland. And so I will do, it's uh, the resume or the, the abstract of my book, in French and German. Um, you, the slide is changing, it's okay. It works. Okay. okay. Uh, well, the, my main goal was to produce enough electricity for substitution of nuclear power in Switzerland, for full decarbonization of road and off-road transportation, but no aviation, 
and also for heat pumps in order to full decarbonize the, the building sector, obviously also with retrofit of buildings uh, insulating like this. And we have some special condition in Switzerland. We have, a very, we have a very strong hydropower with huge storage, but we have few additional potential. And uh, the second special uh, setup is that we have a strong opposition against wind power and not a so high potential for wind power. Wind power would be good because it's winter electricity. Uh, but we have a very high solar potential, especially on rooftop, which is interesting. And we have a, a difficulty. We use a lot of electricity in winter. And with this special condition, we have no problem for short run um, grid balancing because we can use hydropower or even pumps if we have too many electricity. But we have a huge seasonal deficit of, of electricity in winter. And obviously, this deficit is increasing when we, uh, when we uh, take uh, nuclear energy away and if we have more heat pump. So the beginning situation of production and consumption in Switzerland for electricity, this is the actual situation from January 11 to December uh, 16. You see, we have the run of the water with a peak uh, at the end of spring, melting snow. Then we have the hydro storage, also with a peak in the summer because there is too much water, but not bad in winter because we use the reserve. The nuclear power, uh, nuclear power with some problem at the end. And then our actual consumption line. This is the existing situation. You see, we import a little bit in winter and we export a little bit in, in summer. And then if we go further, we have the nuclear power plant fading out. And then we have an increase in, in um, consumption because of uh, transport decarbonization, full decarbonization, and also of the heat pump. And uh, you see the electricity for heat pump, it's mostly in winter, not in summer, logically. And this, uh, uh, the meaning of this is that we need this electricity that we don't have. It's about 45 uh, terawatt hour for one year. Our actual consumption brutto is about, um, is about uh, 62. And at this moment, you will ask, are you crazy to, to cover this with, uh, with solar energy because you have a, you, you have a missing quantity of electricity in, uh, in summer and a huge missing quantity of electricity in winter? And this was the starting point of my reflection. My initial intuition was to put about 40 gigawatt photovoltaic with a strong development of seasonal storage, eight a new hydro dam, or power to gas and obviously to, to reinforce the grids, the distribution and transportation grid. But after computing the, the monthly, monthly model, I took the monthly dimension because of the, the question is season, is not short run. I came to another base scenario of my solar plan. And that is, this is what the one I will, yet, I will now present. I go to 50 gigawatt photovoltaic. We have about two, we had about two 2018. I see the multiplication by uh, 25 that I propose. Very few power to gas, no additional hydro dam, mainly no additional greedy investments, but instead of it, peak shaving. I say peak shaving, the, the, the correct expression is curtailment. I, I, but I say peak shaving of the excessive uh, photovoltaic production in summer, which basically a reduced harvesting of electricity. And with this huge quantity of photovoltaic, we have a decent PV generation in winter. And in the worst case, in the case we don't have other sources, we could use fossil gas for the missing part in winter. At the end, it's, a, it's the CO2 balance with the decisive. I have done two important assumptions. We cannot import more electricity in the winter, and we cannot export more electricity in the summer, in the winter, because other country, all the European country need their own electricity. And in summer, they all have too many, too much uh, uh, photovoltaic. And this is the result. All the same on the simulation on the same period, uh, 2011 to 2016. Uh, uh, six, no, 60, 60, oh, sorry. Uh, you see, you, you, we have the new consumption line. 
that I've showed before. And we see that we have in around seven to eight months a year, we have, we have uh, enough solar energy in the total of the months. There are some difference from year to year, depending on, 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 uh, on, uh, on the sun, on the water, on the raining, on the melting of snow, but more or less it's the same structure. And you see, I begin first with the summer. In the summer, you, you can make peak shaving. You don't harvest this part, curtailment. And that's the reason you understand why I say I use in Switzerland peak shaving because of the mountain, people understand much more better peak shaving than curtailment. Then you have a small part that you, use for alimenting the new power to gas uh, in summer. And then the rest, this is the, uh, the rest, this is the actual exportation, the same degree of exportation. And then you use the gas from power to gas for remaking electricity, reconversing electricity in winter. This is the, the purple part, but it's a small part. And obviously you still have a deficit in winter uh, because you see here, you have a lot of solar electricity, but it's not enough to match the demand who is here. And for this, in order not to, to import more than in the past, you need fossil generation. Obviously, it's a worst case. But you see, uh, if you look at the graphic, you have much more yellow than gray, logically, because it's a, it's a strong solar uh, presentation. And then, uh, what's the balance sheet of this? You have we could have 49 terawatt of PV, but we have peak shaving for five, 11% of the average production. So we use 38 uh, uh, terawatt hour directly in the months where it's, when it's produced and six for additional seasonal storage, power to gas. And we need nine terawatt hour fossil generation of natural gas in, in, in this worst case that we don't have wind, that we cannot import a renewable like this. And this is about four and a half million tons. And the question is, what's the CO2 balance of this operation? The CO2 balance is re we reduce road and off-road from 16 million tons to zero, building also uh, from, uh, from 15 million tons uh, to, to zero. And fossil power, we don't have, actually in Switzerland, we have a small increase, but at the end for this perimeter, we have a reduction of uh, a decrease of CO2 of 86%, which is very strong. strong. If you have done the first 86%, it's not so difficult to make the last 14%. But uh, anyway, this is the, the, the balance. And it was, some, some, as I presented it, it was a little bit surprising for the people, but it was quite well accepted. The key, uh, the key, for the political uh, and technical acceptance of mass PV was peak shaving for two reasons. First, the, the, the utilities always ask, what do we do if we have too much electricity? And I say, no problem, you make peak shaving, uh, you see a, a summer curve and you make the, 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 you only harvest the blue and you, 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 you don't harvest the, the red part. So that over one year, this is 2017, it would have give, given this curve. You see the blue line, line is the real use production and you renounce to the, uh, you don't use the, the red part. And maybe you make such a curve, depend on the need. But at the end, with this extreme peak shaving at 35% of the nominal uh, production in Switzerland, you only less you only lose 20% of the production. And you lose the production when there is too much electricity and when the price are low. So that is not a big, not a huge economical problem. Here you have a comparison with um, run of the river. This is very interesting because you see that photovoltaic and run on the river are more complementary, especially at the beginning of the, of the year. Uh, from February on, we have, uh, photovoltaic is stronger than run of the river as the melting of the snow in the on the glacier help run of the river but at the beginning pv is better with this profile profile and this is very interesting uh, also for the complementarity of pv on run of, of the river well this was the question what do, do you do if you have too much power but you you you, you can make big shaving 
But peak shaving is also very helpful for the winter because you can install much more. On this, this slide was, in all the presentation, was very useful to explain all the utilities and the, the grid and the electrical company that solar energy help. I make two steps. First step is I go from two to 20 gigawatt, 10 times more than we have, we had. On December, it's a small production. Obviously, we are under the limit of the grid of the pump of uh, 15 uh, gigawatt. And then uh, September, it's a nice production. It's okay, no problem, we can absorb this. Also in June, we can absorb this, it's okay. But if I do the second step and I go to 50, uh, to, uh, to 50 gigawatt, then it's very nice in December, but I have a problem in September because I am too high. I, it's more than the, the network and the, the, the grid and the pump can absorb and the same problem obviously in June. And here it's a point where peak shaving is very useful because I say, okay, I reduce, I reduce the, the harvesting and I take only the yellow part and I, on the, 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 the peak, I don't use the peak on the same obviously in June. And with this, I can have much more electricity in, uh, in uh, December, and I also have more electricity in September or, or in March, also especially morning in the evening, and obviously a little bit also uh, in June. And this, to at the point where the, pe the political people and the manager understood this, it was a very, very deadlocking of the of the um, uh, of the acceptance of solar power. And yet, now what's the outlook? Overall story is obviously decarbonization. It's not only substituting uh, nuclear energy. I, we have to have a, a, a full comprehensive scheme. It is possible that if, if uh, storage technology improves, that we will never take, that peak shaving will never take place. But the mere possibility of having peak shaving helps to lift opposition against photovoltaics uh, by utilities, by business lobby, by uh, public administration, all the Bedenkenträger, Bedenkenträger, they say in German, all people who are saying, uh, carrying objections, they, they could be convinced that, it's, that it, it works like this. Um, and you, it's much easier to accept the concept of a mass PV deployment because you know you have the, 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 the you have the peak, in worst case you can do peak shaving. And it's not so important if you don't know every detail of the storage of the grid 2040 or 2050, you can begin with a huge quantity by now. Uh, and you don't have to fear the, the network congestion. Another aspect which is very important, slightly oversizing PV, enhance the security of supply and also the resilience of the, the electrical, uh, furniture and this is the electrical production and this is in time of covid you see that resilience is very important in conclusion i would say that pv is the key technology on the past path to decarbonization in combination 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 with hydro with wind and with the storage the exact mix depend obviously on the country on the concrete situation but I think it's that this concept of having huge quantity on the, in worst case shaving helps a lot. So that was what I wanted to present. Thanks a lot for the attention. Thank you very much, Roger. This was a good introduction showing really uh, what we can do and we don't have to be afraid of doing it. Uh, I think now uh, Tomas has gotten the slides which I managed to send over, Tomas. Yes. Now, now I, uh, Roger, I, unfortunately, you need to give me power back. <laughs> <laughs> so you just click on my on my uh, screen, and then uh, you can give me the rights rights of of host. In this case, I think I will be able. Oh, okay. okay. All right, so uh, again, I already told you these are slides originally from uh, Tony Seba, but both Thomas and I would like to use them. I saw them as well from others. This picture here from 1900 Fifth Avenue, New York, uh, you see many, many, a lot of traffic on the road, oh, but uh, you have to look, ah, you have to look very carefully uh, in order to see, uh, can you click to the next one? Uh, you know, um, Tomasz, if you enter presentation mode, then you can simply click 
as I have done. Ah, let's do yeah. like this. You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe this is why it didn't work. Maybe this was my mistake, actually. Okay. And you see here, uh, there is one car among all these horse-driven carriages. The next slide shows the same situation uh, 13 years later in 1913. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yes. And here you see still a lot of traffic 10 years later, but among all this traffic, it's all cars. And only if you go to the next slide, you see that there is uh, as well a horse uh, visible. So it's one horse driven carriage among all the cars. This is really what Tony calls a true disruption from innovation to the market to disruption. I didn't want to go back. We were fine. Yeah. You know, uh, you can stay doing the same things just a little bit better, improving the carriages, or you can go to disruption, making the old things obsolete. And actually, when you go to the next slide, we see uh, this is how a car around this time looked like. And the funny thing is, this is an electric car. You see the big batteries, these were lead acid batteries on the bottom. But what is today difficult to Remember is that there was a big technology race between electric cars and fuel cars. And of course, this is where we are today. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, and uh, Tony has, of course, many examples for disruptions. On the left-hand side, you see the good old Walkman with these cassettes, which was already a disruption at that time compared to listening to a radio, which you kept to your ears. This was replaced by the CD, but who would have imagined that the CD has only a lifespan of about 10 years in the real market. And now it is replaced, of course, by live streaming. And who uh, wants to deal? I even now, when I rent a car, the cars usually don't have CD players anymore. So this is really how quickly it goes. And many companies uh, have missed this type of technology disruption. I was just mentioning that among these examples, uh, uh, there is as well the example of uh, Xerox, Xerox Park had developed actually the personal computer as we know it today, you know, with true black on white uh, screens with local area networks directly connected to laser printers. But Xerox determined that what the scientists at Xerox Park did was just a game and they were not interested. And then came uh, Steve Wozniak, uh, Steve Jobs and, and uh, Steve Wozniak, and they saw this and then they started to found Apple and you know the rest of the story. Next slide uh, uh, shows uh, that indeed uh, many specialists always say or have no idea of what disruption really means. The specialists who say that uh, uh, iPhone's impact will be minimal and of course uh, uh, internet uh, might not really uh, get very far. Specialists usually look uh, linearly into the future they do not really see exponential growth. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, smart people and smart organizations, they only think within their own thinking, like 1850, the whale oil industry in the United States, which could never imagine that you can easily get a liquid uh, fuel uh, just out of the ground instead of the complicated process of harvesting whales and making whale oil. So uh, this is really what is uh, so difficult to comprehend, exponential growth is much, much faster. I'm very sorry to say that we all got used these days to exponential growth when we were talking about the coronavirus. This was as well an incredibly disruptive process, of course. And if you don't take this into account, you are at the lower end there where you think you will end up there. But in reality, exponential growth brings you much, much higher. And this is uh, the uh, very, uh, direct uh, uh, indication of, you know, how exponential growth happenings uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, technology advancement. You have many, many years of very, very slow pro uh, progress and suddenly the curve lifts off. And this is exactly, we are just at this turning point in terms of the PV uh, situation. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, here you see many examples of such uh, really disruptive interruptions. You know, you see it in the introduction of electricity or down uh, introduction of smartphones and tablets always happens in a similar situation. It takes a long time till uh, uh, technology development gets ripe, uh, which means uh, the 
uh, product has to be good enough, the cost has to be low enough, and then it lifts off exponentially. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, and uh, how many journalists employs the biggest provider? This is an example out of a different area. Next slide shows uh, Facebook. Facebook is the company which employs today the most journalists. And who would have imagined that? Or how many hotels own the biggest rooms provider? And who is it? And it is Airbnb, you know, dot uh, Marriott or, or Hilton, or how many cars uh, does own the biggest person kilometer provider? It's not uh, any of the big guys, it is Uber. So these are really good examples of disruptive technologies. And the topic of our session today is really how disruptions converge and they converge, especially in the clean tech area. So solar has grown in the last uh, uh, couple of uh, years enormously and uh, we expect it to continue to grow. These are of course expectations we see the cumulative uh, expected storage, but this is actually a very, very old, oh no, this is now batteries, yeah. Storage deployment, same situation, not only for PV, but as well for battery storage. And who knows if these predictions are still not much too low compared to what we are really heading on. And uh, uh, the cars, uh, again, it could be by 2030 that half of the new cars will be electric. Uh, if things uh, uh, really pick up because the experience of uh, the coronavirus has shown what advantage it is if the cars don't spew out uh, fumes. You know, we have clean air and good smelling airs. And our prediction is really that 2030 is what was 2013 for the uh, traffic situation. And 2030 will be uh, for the energy sector. This means investments in the old energy will be obsolete. And yeah, the last, I think this is about the last slide, it shows really that this type of uh, development and disruption is not only in the clean tech area, it is everywhere. But today, of course, we want to focus on the clean tech area and we want to focus on the discussion how different disruption and different fields come together. These are investments in pay-as-you-go solar companies, which are companies where uh, the customer doesn't have to pay. Uh, this is not only clean techs, it uh, shows social media, internet, uh, uh, and many other areas. And now you see the circle, which means, you know, you get an effect from other disruptions, like the disruption in the internet of things, uh, which means distributed delivery of whatever is needed, blockchain, new and innovative ways of paying. And of course, this will change uh, our whole, whole life. But what we are discussing today is, of course, the part of this change, which will affect uh, uh, climate gas and emissions and which will be really the clean tech part of it. And this is where we are heading on. Uh, for Europe alone, I know the prediction now uh, from uh, the Lut University of seven terawatts of PV for Europe alone. And you see the lowest line for the world. We are heading at about 70,000 gigawatts, seven tera, 70 terawatts. And if you think that this will be not in 2050, but earlier, you see immediately that with a world market of 150 gigawatt production per year, we will never enter anywhere there. So the prediction that the world market goes from 100 gigawatt per year to 200, 300, 500 gigawatt per year is uh, very easy to make. And we really change the world in so many ways as it is indicated on this very nice graph. And uh, 2030, we will expect the change of the world's leading paradigm. And uh, this is the goal. Maybe we leave this once, one, once back, uh, one, one slide back again. Uh, yeah, this is of course really what we are heading to. 100% renewables, electric transportation, smart cities, connected people, access to education. This is really uh, what the world in 2030 should be like and we will all work very hard to achieve this and now we can see the last slide with our dear friend Tony Seba who really developed this uh, model of the disruption technology disruption he calls himself on his business card chief disruptor and uh, we will see now between 2021 and 2030 
we are after the tipping point, the PV production will multiply itself together with the storage uh, production and the transformation of the energy system. In the first quarter of this year in Germany, already 52% of our electricity came from renewables, which was the combined effect of the decreasing energy consumption in the time of the lockdown, together with the stable electricity uh, production from the renewables. So the fossils could be turned down and we know what happened, of course, with the oil price, where the renewables are coming. So exciting times, this Earth Day today and this week is exciting week. And I think now we enter our discussion and I would like to call for uh, Andrew from Australia to uh, come in and I have shared your slides uh, with uh, Tomas. So Tomas, you have uh, the slides from Andrew as well. This is, I will check once again. Yeah, so, I, I sent you both files. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Ah, no, this is this one second. I hope PowerPoint works. This okay. is PowerPoint, yeah. Yes, yes. I can share my screen if necessary. Ah, it's good. Ah, as you wish. I can, I can, I can show. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so carrying on from the um, theme that Ike developed, um, solar, PV, and wind won the energy race. Everything else is going to fade into the background. What you see there are the um, net additions um, over 2015 to 19 for main generation technologies. Um, nuclear, bio, solar thermal, geothermal, ocean energy are going nowhere. Hydro is shrinking because um, fewer rivers are left to dam and there's stronger opposition to new hydro. Coal is shrinking. Um, gas is hanging in there, but solar PV and wind are overwhelmingly the, uh, the energy race winners. Next slide. Uh, one, one back, that's right. So um, there's a lot of trouble getting uh, solar into Europe because it's so far north, uh, along with North America and Northeast Asia, and it has cold winters and the ratio of summer sun to winter sun is a ratio of three or four or worse. Um, however, three quarters of the world's population does not live in the north. They live in the sun belt, plus or minus 35 degrees of latitude, including Australia, all of Africa, nearly all of South America, all of uh, Southern Asia. That's where most of the people live, most of the energy growth, most of the population growth, most of the growth in emissions. And this is the uh, new reality that um, in fact, all the problems that um, Europe, European people talk about simply don't exist in the, um, in the Sun Belt. So Australia with a population of 25 million is installing um, solar and wind at a rate per capita that is 10 times the global average and four times the rate in Europe or Japan or China or the USA. And um, it's just happening because of compelling economics. And this is in the face of bitter opposition from the national government, which is very pro coal. Australia is the largest coal exporter in the world, the largest gas exporter in the world, and is also the largest renewable energy deployer in the world per capita by far. So compelling economics can drive a change right over the top of even a hostile government. So next slide. Mm -hmm. So a lot of talk about um, the difficulty of handling uh, storage requirements and uh, opposition to damming of new rivers for hydro storage, which is 99% of all electricity storage at present. Um, we at ANU did a global off-river pumped hydro atlas. We found more than 600,000 off-river sites all outside national parks and urban areas with a combined energy capacity of 23 million gigawatt hours. That's a million gigawatts times 23 hours. This is a mind boggling amount of energy. It's about a hundred or more times more than needed to support a, a global 100% renewable energy system. 
not electricity, but energy. And uh, you can see that um, these off river sites, these are sites away from rivers, um, uh, pairs of small um, square kilometer sized reservoirs with an altitude difference of 500 to 800 meters, they're just everywhere. And in fact, the most difficult place in the world for finding them is in fact, Northwest Europe, um, uh, north of the Alps, but everywhere else has vast numbers close to where population and load centers are. So in fact, there is not a, an issue with storage and um, the combination of storage and long distance transmission and wind and solar and batteries, of course, um, can really produce 100% uh, renewable electricity uh, with nothing to invent. So that's all I needed to say. Thank you, Andrew. And I think really uh, with this notion, you make a real impact because uh, most people have not realized that storage at the moment worldwide is indeed hydro storage. And especially uh, what is important, we can do with hydro really everywhere uh, such wonderful things because all you need is this geographic conditions, which as your map shows so beautifully uh, um, convincing, it could be available anywhere in the world. And of course, hydro storage has as well the advantage that it can be deployed uh, on a fraction of a second if needed, and it can be switched off on the next fraction of a second. So there is no uh, big latent time and so on involved. Um, absolutely. I think this is a very good example of what we want to talk about, the issue of convergence of technologies, you know, just in the right moment, this is available. And uh, this is, of course, very useful for us. So uh, now I like uh, to come to our uh, uh, friend from uh, uh, Turkey. Let me see. Oh, I have here a mess on my screen. I think he disappeared. Yeah. Okay. Oh, he disappeared. Yeah. Well, let's see. Here it is. Yeah. So Tolga Murat, he is here or not? No. Then we go to Alexei. This is the next one. Ah, yeah. Thank you, Marash. Can you hear me? Well, yes. yeah. Thank you. Great. So um, I have not prepared the uh, slides, but um, uh, I'm happy to. I think it would be great if I uh, somehow continue the story that I started uh, during my introduction for you to better understand how these. Uh, disruptive technologies uh, movement evolved uh, since some years and how they supported and how the adoption is, is going on. So um, as mentioned, uh, together with our colleagues and uh, uh, Dr. Anton Galenovich, who unfortunately passed away and uh, uh, Andrea knew him and even met him in Geneva. So um, he was a, a very big um, scientist and economist in terms of, um, you know, continuing the um, knowledge um, of the Austrian economic school of transactional costs and bridging uh, this uh, concept with uh, new digital technologies such as blockchain. So, uh, as you know, the, one of the main problems in the climate finance market is the accountability of impact and trust between uh, the players who issue and buy uh, green securities, green assets, such as uh, green bonds or carbon credits or some other um, green financial instruments. And um, Dr. Galenovich came up with an idea to and provide some kind of a more transparent, more reliable uh, framework that could enable um, direct peer-to-peer -peer communication with these stakeholders and uh, what is very important to measure uh, and account and attribute the impact to those who uh, contributed to the um, creation of this impact. And uh, uh, together with him and some other colleagues, we realized that uh, blockchain technology, which is a uh, transparent and um, a reliable uh, database that actually records uh, transactions, including financial transactions and other information, uh, which is a kind of a new um, uh, level um, in the databases science, 
can really serve here as some kind of a basic infrastructure and uh, those financial assets can be issued on the basis of those records that are were made directly uh, to blockchain. And uh, so we started to build uh, this kind of an infrastructure um, on an open source uh, basis so everybody could reach it and uh, every member of this market can benefit from using this uh, infrastructure. And also here we implemented not only blockchain, this registry, but also smart contracts, which are also um, kind of a useful feature of uh, blockchain technology and which currently um, provides a pre-programmed contract. So it's full analog of a paper contract in a digital form written in the form of code. So uh, with this, uh, we uh, pioneered with the uh, world's first carbon credit transaction, uh, which originated uh, from the solar power project in Mauritius uh, on blockchain. And uh, what we did is we uh, recorded that uh, those voluntary carbon credits, they were transferred from the centralized registry, which uh, exists uh, on the market to a decentralized registry on the blockchain, public blockchain. And then uh, it was, uh, they were sold from the French uh, trader group to our Russian carbon fund. So here we, we showed how the technology works. This tra transaction, which was uh, cross-border, it took really several minutes and uh, all the information was really uh, transparent. So uh, where the carbon credits came from, who verified them, who verified, for example, their cancellation in the centralized registry and their transfer to the decentralized registry and buyers and sellers. So everything is open and uh, you can see it and everybody can see it from any computer and no uh, participant can change it. So this, um, this was really acknowledged by the UN, by the World Bank. We were invited to showcase this experience to various conferences including the United uh, Nations uh, Climate Conference, a COP in, in Bonn. And uh, there we met uh, a lot of uh, some other people who experimented with blockchain technology, including uh, Masamba Tiowe, who is uh, head of the Department of Sustainable Development Mechanisms of the Paris Agreement. And uh, together with this uh, group, we realized that uh, indeed there is an understanding that uh, disruptive technologies can really bring value to this market and uh, UN, UNFCCC uh, supports it. And uh, kind of we united to form the Climate Chain Coalition. This is uh, the first uh, global association which is um, devoted to implementation and research of disruptive technologies for the climate action and not only blockchain, but all sorts of other uh, technologies. And that happened uh, back in 2017. And uh, when we came to various uh, market members uh, at the World Bank conferences, tried to explain uh, the benefits, then we quickly realized that uh, not all of the market members really want the disruption. This is also another problem with new technologies yes. because uh, those carbon markets, climate finance, uh, is a quite a conservative market. Uh, some of its segments is not growing. It's really fragmented and there is a clear oligopoly on this market. So uh, the main actors, they actually didn't want any disruption to uh, sustain their business models. And um, some people thought we're kind of uh, just a crazy uh, guys, engineers, um, uh, IT people that want to bring some unnecessary uh, new stuff to this market. But <laughs> yeah, but uh, times, uh, you know, uh, passed and uh, during these three years, we made uh, more experiments with uh, solar power, um, for example, um, because uh, we tried to um, connect to the registry, to the blockchain registry, direct measurements of the power generation and direct measurements of the impact that is made calculated directly and reported and use this data to issue um, finance instruments to um, uh, bring more capital flows to the solar power uh, industry, for example. 
And uh, we made an uh, experiment with the power plant in Chile where we connected uh, the smart sensors that measured the energy output uh, directly to this blockchain registry and uh, issued uh, renewable energy credits based on this information in alignment with uh, IREC uh, standard, which is, you probably know, kind of a widespread standard. And by the way, uh, IREC standard uh, really looks um, very deeply into blockchain technology and uh, their officials uh, state that um, this technology is the next technological level and that IREC standard encourages implementation of these kinds of innovative technologies. And now there are many companies that uh, develop this kind of renewable energy credits on blockchain, such as Energy Web Foundation, for example. And uh, they all work in cooperation with IREC standard to uh, provide uh, you know, the verification of the standard. Because uh, another problem of the blockchain, um, it's a problem of um, what you put into blockchain. Because blockchain itself is immutable and you cannot change the data. But uh, you should check or double check what you put there. Because if you put faulty information, then it will exist there forever and uh, it, it will not be uh, really good. So you still need a physical uh, human auditor to see whether the sensors are working properly and whether uh, the project is meeting standards, for example. But uh, we frankly think that it's uh, not for a long time and that uh, actually uh, computers and AI can do this work uh, for the auditor and check whether the sensors are working properly or, or not based on algorithms of their um, usual work and so on, some other uh, algorithms. Yeah. So, uh, um, Alexei, just, just yeah. let me uh, intervene. Um, I think what is very important as well to understand in the uh, project of Alexei and, and, and Anton, who uh, unfortunately, Galenovic, who, who left us last year. Um, by the way, uh, last uh, physical meeting we had uh, in Geneva, and the first uh, time I met Anton was halfway between Geneva and Lausanne, uh, Roger. Uh, um, uh, um, but what was quite important as well, and unfortunately, uh, our friend Nikona Nigli, who is a little bit the Mr. Sustain Sustainability from Geneva, uh, couldn't make it um, because Geneva is right now uh, on the way to, to, to make the bridge between um, modern technology like blockchain um, and sustainable investment. Uh, and what is extremely important here is, and uh, now I, I make a reference on this morning session uh, when we had uh, very important members from all over the world, um, particularly as well from, from Mali, from Africa. Um, we need to, to show them as well their possibility as well to help them um, because their forests, um, they, they do some service. Uh, yes, but Andre, maybe we intent. give Alexei the chance yeah, just, to just, finish just, his presentation. Yes, yeah. just let, let, let me, let me just go to Africa sentence, right now. No, no, sure. I don't want to go on. I don't, I don't want to go to Africa. But the, uh, the reason why I mentioned that is um, um, uh, the, the company of Alexei and Anton, uh, they um, uh, use as well blockchain uh, to, um, to, to um, uh, give some card and credits uh, to, to a forest plantation in Papua New Guinea. Sounds a little bit strange, but I think there it's as well carbon credits could help as well to, to support a renewable energy project, but as well other projects. That was just a short. Ah, yeah, thanks, Sandra. So um, I, I just want to, in my presentation, I want to give you a, bi a bigger picture and how this uh, all scene evolved. So um, I want uh, not only mention our project, but also uh, in the Climate Change Coalition, we now have more than 200 members from more than 50 countries and uh, UNFCCC, um, officially supports Climate Change Coalition and um, uh, the, their head of the department is a co-chair. And uh, each day, each week, more people are joining from the project side, from the um, investor side and um, academia side and so on from many, many countries. Uh, yesterday, there was a woman who runs an NGO in Kenya um, doing projects in terms of fuel efficient cooking stoves. Uh, she just joined a uh, climate change coalition and a lot of people around the globe in developing countries they need uh, new tools new resources to reach um, their uh, kind of do donors right and those who are willing to invest or who are willing to support and uh, not only provide them a kind of a beautiful certificate but maybe part of the cash flow of the revenue stream or the impact results that can that they also can capitalize 
But to provide this value chain of climate action, we need not only blockchain. And uh, what I want to say is, is, is it's not a single silver bullet, right? And there is no single silver, silver bullet and blockchain is, is not a silver bullet. So uh, to provide this long value chain, you need uh, more tools and you also need basic infrastructure and standards. And uh, this is uh, what we're now focusing on in the climate change coalition. And it is very important that these standards and approaches uh, should be um, kind of open source really and open for the public and transparent uh, to also match the spirit of blockchain, but also to provide this uh, kind of value to, to the people around the globe. And another example, what uh, Climate Change Coalition is doing, uh, there is a Dutch group uh, who originally come from the uh, uh, reality space, and uh, they are working with the Dutch um, uh, register to provide um, object uh, identification, buildings identification on blockchain, kind of a um, common registry where all the properties, uh, essential properties of buildings can be found by everyone and cannot be altered. And uh, in the Climate Change Coalition, they're providing their approach and methodology to uh, jointly develop a global uh, unique object identification infrastructure, which also could be uh, useful for, for example, for solar power projects. Because when somebody is willing to invest, uh, an investor, then he needs to know whether the project developer really holds the rights for this uh, project uh, kind of site, right? That uh, the project site really matches the um, properties in the documents. Uh, and this could be checked, for example, uh, using satellites. If the project boundary really matches the project description in the design document. And uh, it brings also more clarity. And when the investor invests in this project, then he wants uh, to somehow monitor his portfolio and see what is the energy output, uh, what is the CO2 reductions. And now this could be made in real time. For example, when we presented our platform for impact measurement and investment during the last COP uh, UN Climate Summit in Madrid, there was a project by uh, EBRD and by uh, uh, some very well-known Swiss group, South Pole. They are uh, developing a dashboard for the portfolio of uh, renewable energy projects for the EBRD group. And uh, exactly the same purpose, because the portfolio is big and they want to see, the investor wants to see what's happening with the portfolio, what is the energy output. Uh, analyze this data and see maybe what measures could be done uh, to better manage the portfolio of these projects and to increase the energy output to increase the impact. So uh, this is another example how this all can be done together. And maybe to finalize, I can tell you as, as a person who uh, develops and uh, promotes this kind of technologies for complicated climate finance markets that are sometimes very political that have those complicated market structures uh, this year together with uh, uh, my fellow members of the climate change coalition we see that uh, you know the adoption before the crisis but i think the crisis will even accelerate it because we see how digital technologies really help to uh, fight the crisis and its consequences and a lot of people including uh, UN and uh, Europe are saying that we need uh, to use this time to transform our economic and social models and um, digital technologies is a key enabler. But before the crisis, uh, we um, participated in some very encouraging events in Brussels, uh, which was called blockchain for the Green Deal. Uh, and uh, also a very encouraging uh, event in Berlin which was uh, titled something like uh, Digital as Sustainable Development Finance Connecting the Dots. And uh, this event was, uh, those two events were um, um, held by some official structures with participation of European authorities. For example, uh, Werner Hoyer, who is the president of the European Investment Bank. And he made some very good, clear statements 
that European investment bank uh, right now uh, needs to embrace uh, digital technologies, marry them with the climate finance and become a digital climate bank. That's what he uh, actually said during this event in Berlin. And uh, this is not only, you know, kind of statements that we frequently see from uh, bureaucrats, but also there are real um, use cases, projects by uh, such banks as KFW, for example, in Africa with blockchain and uh, some other banks like BBVA Bank that issued uh, internally uh, the green bond on blockchain to provide a seamless measurement and somehow connect uh, the coupon payments of the bond with the impact performance. And this is actually what UNF C is now thinking about. Uh, they are designing new approaches to uh, somehow um, uh, deal with the greenwashing that is also growing uh, on the green finance market. And uh, those technologies can really bring transparency and traceability of impact enabled peer-to-peer -peer communication excluding um, unnecessary intermediaries, uh, bringing climate finance to those areas that were not covered before, to the underbanked people and project, significantly lowering the transactional costs and costs of the uh, carbon projects, climate projects, and so on. Because if you dealt with it, you probably know that you have to uh, fill in tons of papers, uh, receive verification, determination, and uh, all, all this uh, stuff, you know, to just issue those instruments. Now we're entering the era where this is more accessible. We're democratizing this market and helping to bridge uh, UN uh, Sustainable Development uh, Goals uh, investment gap, which is assessed by OECD as uh, 2.5 trillion at minimum. So Thanks. maybe... Yeah, at this point, I will end my... Thank presentation. you, Alexei. I think this was very useful for all of us because this is a world or part of the digital world we have not been looking in very carefully. I do have a very fundamental question. I understand blockchain, which means that all participants in a blockchain network have basically all information. And I think this works very well when we are talking about 100 or 1,000 people. But can you imagine distributing energy to millions of people based on blockchain because the needed computing power would explode. You know, at the end of the day, we need all the world's energy to power the computers to, to make blockchain with a billion people. So do you really think the blockchain approach is suitable to connect consumers, for instance, of uh, electricity rather than only to be a model for limited entities, you know, where you have hundreds of entities or so, so that the computing needs are staying limited. Do you really believe blockchain can be a technology for a huge uh, number of uh, consumers? This is a, that's a good question and uh, frequently asked um, at the blockchain sessions regarding uh, sustainability and uh, right. tech. Um, the, the answer is that uh, is, uh, you know, the maturity and development of the technology, because, uh, of course, the first uh, prototypes, the first uh, concepts of, of this uh, technology implementation for energy market, for other purposes, for finance, uh, were really um, carbon intensive and uh, a lot of computational power were needed to, yeah. to uh, provide this proof of work type of uh, consensus, um, verification of these uh, transactions. But uh, now there are new generation of uh, solutions entering into market that uh, don't have this problem with uh, carbon footprint and also that are providing interoperability. As, a, as a, any technology like solar power, for example, you remember that uh, the times in 80s where people said that it will never <laughs> be cheaper than coal and gas and so on. So it, it's just uh, people told that academics, very respected people told that it's impossible, right? But now right. Uh, we see that, you know, the, the speed of um, progress, technical progress, uh, the, um, you know, the speed of development of the IT infrastructure and hardware is increasing exponentially. And uh, this year and even last year, 
uh, you you could see the new generation of blockchain technologies that uh, have less uh, minuses compared to their pre predecessors, right? So uh, this is not only my opinion, and um, it is also opinion, for example, of the uh, UN task force on uh, UN Secretary General's task force on uh, digital SDG finance, which will end its work in July and provide their final report on the limitations, pluses and minuses of technology maturity issues, and also European Union, which has uh, the DG Connect and. Um, EBTCI, which is some something like uh, European blockchain something infrastructure, yeah. which is a official a part of the European Union structure, which deals exactly with these issues uh, in terms of a research a scoping. But now they're finally uh, starting to make uh, real implementations. So yeah. if you want to use this kind of technologies, if you want to be somehow connected to the Green Deal uh, programs and investments, it's very good uh, time to start scoping these opportunities and ma making the pilots. And if you're you. interested in all this, I can share in comments uh, here our recent publication, which is the um, Digital SDG Finance Bulletin. And uh, there we try to um, describe the whole space, the whole scene, the actors, and in the end provide many, many, many links to the reports such as by uh, the Asian Development Bank or the World Bank or some other guys like UN Secretary's General Task Force for you to study this, to look into that and uh, see what's happening. And by the way, in Germany, in Switzerland, uh, the technological scene is very active and we can see some really good ongoing pilots in terms of the uh, uh, smart grids, uh, energy trading, and so on and so on. Okay, I see, Roger, you wanted to comment. Or not? Then I, otherwise I, 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 I'm asking myself if, if, if it's the, 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 if there is in the broad public an interest for such technology. I exactly see that for, it's very interesting for a company managing project of CO2 compensation or, or, or making an electrical trade in real time or storage on the, on the power to gas and then uh, uh, again to, to electricity. All this I see, but for the broad public, the broad public is not interesting. They want to use to have electricity when they need they want to pay it easily once in the month and not every day, and they don't want to interest themselves for this. We see this even I, on the rooftop photovoltaic, which is very popular in Switzerland. At the, in the fir first three months, they look at their production and consumption and make some optimization and then forget about it. Uh, so I, I, I am, in my, you know, my, with my experience, I have some distrust in, 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 in um, in IT, IT innovation on the sector, because IT innovation is a matter of two or three years, and energy production is a matter of 30, 40 years investment. And there is a gap, and there, it's a lot of energy is, is uh, of energy, of, uh, of financial energy, uh, intellectual energy is focused on, on the on the IT innovation, IT innovation, because it's easy on short run. But the problem of innovation is long run and finance, financing it in the in the long run, for me. And therefore, I see I see some gap. Maybe we can close the gap at some extent in using the excedent of 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 wind of photovoltaics like this to to group them and then to put them in a carbon capture or in in a, in a in a power to power to X like this, but the, the practical utility of this innovation, I have some doubt. Also, because with too many information kills the information. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, but it is a secure way. But I just was skeptical whether it can be really rolled out on a broad area. Andre, you were already intervening in a minute ago. How is your opinion about blockchain development? Well, I'm stunned. Don't forget, I'm I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a simple lawyer. Uh, so first, I'm I'm challenged as well by by the new uh, possibilities that we that we as lawyers have as well with the smart contracts, um, and uh, I'm as well quite challenged because well most of the time well you need lawyers and notaries, and I think for us uh, 
um, a lot of things are, are going to change because what is the key element of blockchain? Well, that is trust uh, that we don't need any longer because we can trust the structure as such. Um, so it's it, it going to be a real revolution for the, for for all of us and and, and my my uh, my colleagues. But on the other hand, side, and that was one of the reasons why I mentioned as well these um, uh, points that, that are mentally quite far away. And I, I must admit, when when Anton um, came to us and said, "Hey, uh, there, I, I've got my friends in in Papua New Guinea," I thought, "Well, what has Papua New Guinea here to do with this?" Um, but it's so important, and when we, that was one of the reasons why I mentioned Africa. Um, when we when we talked about this uh, about the needs as well of Africa uh, uh, this morning, uh, there's a huge need that they develop, and um, they're going to leapfrog us um, if you go to Africa. If and you really uh, you... think they need blockchain technology to have a village power? You know, I, I I don't see this at all in Africa because in Africa the basic energy needs are so simple, and we are lucky to have a financing system based on their mobile phone. You know, because the mobile phone has to be paid, then you can pay for electricity. So how in the world would you implement blockchain technology in Africa? I don't see this at all. Well, I, I think uh, well, you know, I'm I'm afraid of holistic approaches, and very often, um, what I realize when when I have to to do with, with African projects is uh, the specialists talk to a specialist on it. So you you have the electricity guys that talk to electricity guys. You have the water guys that talk to water people. So if we want to bring it together as an entire system, as integrated with a payment system, uh, then I think blockchain could be a solution. Um, uh, in a village in Africa. Well, really? if if you have a I mean, if you have a solar mini grid, I mean, just take the example of of of, of Brooklyn or the Brooklyn uh, um, uh, local energy market with blockchain. No, I think this, this is different. This is different. These are highly developed areas and you yes, know, complex, um, but, uh, but 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 very often in, in uh, you see, I, I live in a country um, where where um, um, after twenty years I, I needed to to fill in a, a check. Um, I was surprised, uh, but France still works with checks. Um, so, but nowadays, in lots of African countries, even in the farthest uh, villages away, they pay with their telephone. Exactly, that's what so, I say. But for the telephone, they don't need blockchain. They yeah, but let me telephone. let me step in, uh, gentlemen, please yes, here. Because let, it's your topic. specialist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you see, I think you're all partly right here, or maybe you're not partly. And I here, I, I want to completely agree with Roger and with his first statement. Uh, it's also the the. Uh, you know, kind of the matter of maturity of the technology, because the end user, he doesn't want to know what it, what it is inside, blockchain, some other chain, some artificial intelligence. He just wants to receive uh, good services and live yes. better, right? And uh, this is currently the challenge uh, which not only blockchain, but other digital technologies must pass before the a wider adoption, right? So it, it should be user friendly and it should be really clear and simple for the end user. And uh, when the, these technologies will uh, reach this level of maturity, we will definitely live in another world. And it, it will be definitely easy for the anybody in, in, the, in the world to use it, pushing some simple buttons like on iPhone, right? iPhone was a revolution because there was only one button, right? So when the technology will mature at, at this level, then it will be widespread. And of course, for Africa, for developing countries, there is even more uh, sense to deploy such technologies uh, than even for developed uh, world and northern countries because of this trust problem, transparency, and, and, and so on. But yeah. Alexei, uh, please, please explain Roger. how you understand this, you know, because the essence of blockchain, and I'm an ignorant, complete ignorant, but the essence of blockchain is each participant has the full information about what happens with all other participants. And I think it makes a lot of sense if you talk about electricity companies and whatever. But what sense does it make for a person in Africa to be able to know what hundreds of thousands of other people have in their electricity consumption and so on. You know, why, why, do they, why are they even interested in this transparency? I mean, I have you know, a, um, an overkill. Yeah, Andrew, please. I have a perspective here. PV is so cheap. It's, it's, it is, in a sense, too cheap. <laughs> to yeah. I speak in a country that's got um, 
approaching 11 gigawatts of rooftop solar in the 25 million person country. This is you know, 100 times more than in most countries per capita. And everyone just puts PV on the roof. A quarter of houses have got yeah, it now. It's for nothing. And they just put it on the roof and forget yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, a week after it's on the roof, they've forgotten they put it on the roof. And they. That's what Roger says. Yes. Exactly. It's so cheap. Yeah. It's yeah. so cheap. And so the I think, is so I think uh, blockchain, we don't want to argue anything about the value of blockchain technology in many transactions, but using it for PV, where the sun is shining and providing you electricity without any additional cost to make elaborate financial systems to be able to pay this tiny amounts, which are then left over. I, I really doubt it as well. I think this is a, an open question. Roger, you <laughs> wanted to intervene? Yeah. Yes. I see maybe a place where block, blockchain or similar technology could be useful. It's for carbon capture and removal, not, not for the centralized uh, project with, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, removal carbon from, the, for, from a central source and putting it in the ground, uh, pressing it in the ground. This is not, but for the decentralized ones, for example, uh, wood burial or, or improving the soil, the di uh, different uh, storing wood, basically, instead of burning it or, or, or letting it uh, uh, decompose. And for such a project, there is a, there is a huge trust problem on the long run that it's effectively a long run removal. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we have enough energy, if, uh, if, if the, pro the, the global warming become, become acute, it's probable, probable, maybe there will be some forces for finance, uh, for finance uh, uh, long-term uh, uh, ecological carbon capture. And those projects are decentralized. And maybe there, the fact that you can really document on every square meter where you, the soil did enhance, where in which uh, former carbon mine you put mm. all the wood in it, to store like this, maybe this could be a way to 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 be to be transparent. We have a actually a huge lack of transparency uh, uh, on the carbon uh, on the compensation market. The compensation, it's it's um, like I say in German, ablass uh, 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 I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, in English. Yes. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, it could be interesting for such thing. I, I, and there, it's a more it's a more value, and it's a long run problem. But mm -hmm. for for short run tr trading of micro quantity of electricity, I think that the computing, uh, the, the the need of electricity for computing yeah. is higher yeah. than yes, the so quantity the... of electricity you trade. <laughs> yes. And this is not very useful. Yes. And we have yes. for this we don't have a finance problem. For carbon yeah. carbon removal, we have a problem of finance. This is a very interesting suggestion, Alexei. Have you ever anything? Uh, to do with carbon, uh, uh, keeping track of what happens with carbon emissions. Is that something which ever crossed your path? Yeah, sure, absolutely. From the very beginning, it was one of the original initial ideas to, oh, to yeah. implement blockchain for, for this purpose. And then um, when we made more R&D, we realized that it's even broader and broader. But of course, we're not, we cannot cover everything. And I'm sending you another link to the Energy Web Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, where you can find uh, more examples of how a blockchain is used in the energy market. Uh, and uh, you know, you can see that lots of big utilities have joined them, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, they are doing this stuff in the, in the energy sector. And for the off-grid uh, energy, you know, uh, we need also this kind of. Uh, solutions to finance, to invest in it. And maybe not the people, um, I, I think that uh, the people both in developing countries really needed to control, for example, how the government deals with the energy uh, prices and so on and so on to provide more transparency, but also foreign investors. They really need to make sure uh, what the effects their investments are making and uh, how this is all uh, operates after they invest uh, their some sums of money and it's obvious that they want to see the results in, in, a, in a more transparent way that can really prove that the impact is made and uh, the energy is being produced, for example. Yeah, 
thank you so much. I think this was a very intensive discussion in this area of topics. I would love to use the opportunity that we have Andrew Blakers with us to come back to this really quite revolutionary proposal to use as a storage part of our um, of our convergence of clean tech technologies, hydropower. You showed uh, this map which shows how enormous opportunities for energy stories with hydro exist. My question to you is, is there anything underway? Have you gone beyond mapping out the world? Have you, uh, are there initiatives going on to really systematically increase the use of hydropower storage in order to really develop um, stable, sustainable, uh, renewable-based energy systems? Storage is not needed until you get over about 25% of variable wind and solar PV, and there's very few countries yeah, that are- but we are at 52% now in Germany, you know. Yeah. Um, so this but, will come soon, I hope, you know, this further penetration of- Yeah, uh, solar. so Germany, of course, is, is connected in- Oh, which you lost, yeah. To, to stabilize. Mm -hmm. um, in Australia, um, we are at 26% renewables now. That's increasing by five percentage points every year. Um, this so is we'll, of the electricity or of the total energy? Uh, of electricity. Of electricity, okay. So it will be at 30% um, by about October, 35% by, by next yeah. year. Then you 40. need storage by your own criteria. Um, so we, we have to get started on storage. So in Australia, there's... Um, uh, two large storage, uh, um, pumped hydro storage systems being constructed. One's at two gigawatts and uh, the other is at um, 300 megawatts. Mm -hmm. And there's a dozen really serious proposals at various stages, uh, adding up to another two or three gigawatts. And this is in quite a small country. Uh, and it, it's a flat and arid country. And these yes. uh, storage techniques are essentially off river. So uh, even in a place like Australia, which is not well renowned for hydro, um, yes. there, there's a lot of hydro interest. There's also a lot of interest in, uh, in batteries, a lot of big batteries, 100 megawatt scale batteries going in for the minutes to or seconds to hours um, yeah. storage. And um, gathering steam is a packaging of demand management, people who are willing to switch off their demand at a moment's notice and that's in the order of also in gigawatts so it's when your yeah. wind system gets into the 15 to 20 percent and above range a lot of these uh, ideas stop being theoretical and start becoming very practical and how is this growing in australia under the current negative political framework it happens um, anyway it's overwhelmingly it's economically advantageous yeah. Yeah, you've got compelling economics in a, you know, we've got twice as much sun as uh, Central Europe. And, yes. um, you know, the Central Europe has got wind, but it, it's nothing compared with Australian wind. Yeah. So it, it's just when you've got really good wind and solar and high electricity prices, it just goes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Roger, in Switzerland, what can you say more about the convergence of technologies issue? Because I think Switzerland is, of course, a very interesting example, high tech lots of money available, lots of investment money. Maybe one should connect Switzerland to Australia. You know, that <laughs> seems like a marriage in heaven where you have so much sunshine and still so much area. Uh, you could go 100% renewable in Australia sooner than others. Oh. I would like to hear your Swiss perspective. Well, in the Swiss perspective, the key was to make the junction between all the new technology. The old technology, is is a uh, is the grid and the transform tra transformators who are bi bidirectional. The old technology is water, not only run of the water, but huge uh, reservoir, mm -hmm. with the, also with a huge uh, power, not, not yeah. uh, leistung, uh, not only not only uh, not only a huge quantity of electricity. On the new world, and this is photovoltaic. This is one of the connection. And the other is between central and decentral, because. Due to history, our sector of, of photovoltaic was strongly, strongly des for decentral against central. And in Switzerland, the tipping point was the referendum uh, to, to, to fade out nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. uh, as we won it, there were no more possibility uh, for, 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 the, uh, for the old utilities to, to, 
go back to build new uh, nuclear power, power plants. And then for about two years, they were groggy, no reacting, no, no thinking, nothing. But since, since uh, one, one and a half year, they be, are beginning to interest themselves. For example, it's very interesting. It's now the big utility who are uh, uh, asking for new feed-in tariffs. Oh, uh, for the nuclear. Past, they were against, they were fighting against feed-in tariff. <laughs> We, the solar, we live with an initial subsidies. At the beginning, you get a, an amount you can amortize, and then you can go on the market or make a self use of your self consumption of your electricity. And now the, the, they are interested in. And this is maybe the, the, the biggest problem that we have in the electricity market. It's that nat the natural state of electricity is not, is not a market, it's a monopoly. And if it's a market, it's a market at the marginal cost and not at the full cost. Now we are quite happy in the solar energy that we are near the marginal cost and we are the lowest. So if somebody wants to, to construct a new plan, to build a new plant, it will take its solar, maybe with some subsidies. But in the long run, there are a lot of fixed of sunk cost of fixed cost in the energy mm -hmm. system. And we have a lack of, fi of financing, and it's not a financing with a with a private uh, earning, that, so that you can make a private financing. Financing it has to be collectively financed for different different aspects, inclusive storage, for instance. Mm -hmm. Storage is very useful, but is it's very hard to make it rentable on the market. And since the origin of if you build a dam, it's for 100 years, and it's overcome, it's more than the, the, the it's a longer horizon than the, the private can assume. This yeah. is the key, key the, the, the problem we have. But I had a question to Andrew with all those uh, uh, dams and reservoirs on, on his map. If you studied if there is a synergy between uh, the actual use for, for water for having water for, for, for the agriculture or for the cities and the electrical use, or have, do they have a contradiction? And do they have a reservoir up and one down or not? Such a question, is there a practical plan to use them or it's, a, it's more theoretical because they are in, con in conflict in use? Um, the amount of water required to stabilize the entire Australian electricity system, 100% renewables, is um, about one part in a thousand of the water extracted each year for agriculture. It just doesn't even register. Okay. Because the same water simply goes round and round a circle. Mm -hmm. Years. Okay. And it's it's a, and you, it's only for short run storage, one one night, a few days, or like this. That's right. Yeah, it's not seasonal. Not for months or 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 a year. No. It, it's 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 for. 10, 20, 30 hours, it's not seasonal. And the difference is that Switzerland has a seasonal problem. Three quarters of the world's population lives in the Sun Belt and does not have a seasonal problem. That's a difference. Yeah. Uh, by the way, there is an interesting technology we have at the EPFL. It's the, they are working on a air storage adiabatic and, uh, and with small, at small scale, like 10 kilowatt like this where you can make a difference between the, the power and the quantity of electricity you store with the air, air reservoir until 400 bars. And they get on the prototype 60% efficiency from electricity to electricity, and they hope to come to 70% efficiency. This will pressure, pressurized air or what is- Pressure, it? but they, stab it, they, they compense the adiabatic loss of, of, of temperature by by charging and, um, yeah, and that's uh, a key loss called yeah. by by discharging and with this they can enhance the, the the storage it's still a startup but i i think it's a very interesting startup but it's a, like everything in energy it takes a lot lot of time because you are on the physical yes. board or not on an intellectual board or like in the it yeah yeah yeah. I have a question for... We have a repla replacement of speakers because Alexi needs, needs to leave and uh, Jamie just arrived. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Does the IK... We have still 15 minutes. Yeah, there was... Uh, you were just answering a question. What was this? Or was this... No. I, I, I just wanted to yeah. um, observe that um, trying, trying to balance... Um, solar and wind over the course of a year in a little yeah. country like Switzerland is very, very hard because the weather there is all the same. 
um, it just makes so much more sense to balance at the whole the, the scale of the whole of Europe through transmission. Right. Um, Absolutely. I'm ever puzzled by the, the, the perceived difficulty of putting in 10 and 20 gigawatt HVDC cables from one place to another. So wind from the north and uh, sun from the south. Uh, you're puzzled by the need to do this or uh, what did you want the, to say? That, that, uh, the, the, that so many people talk about power to gas with its awful efficiency yeah. uh, compared with simply putting in a cable from the North Sea. Oh, you know, I see what you're saying. Yeah, if you would put in um, yes. wind cables from yes, the North Sea, yes, yes. unlimited. And and, and, and take Norway. Norway, with this enormous hydro potential, which does not have to be pumped up the hill, but which is just water flowing down the hill by itself. And this you can as well uh, dam off and then use it whenever you need it. You know, you can collect the, the power when you don't need it. So absolutely right. So for this purpose, it is useful. I wanted to come back to the issue of the uh, convergence of clean technology. I think really- I, I can excuse, yeah, if, if interrupt, uh, since Please. we got a new speaker. So uh, very welcome. Uh, but I don't, I don't see Australia. Her, but it's not in the, where yes, do I, I see I can, I can see her. Um, ah, here you so, are. Hi, Gemma. Well, so well, so how is it possible you can't see that wonderful uh, smile so oh, because the, li <laughs> the line is, is, is uh, uh, finer leg. so welcome uh, jama and it's just time that you can uh, still introduce yourself sure so um my name is Gemma green i'm a co-founder and the chairman of a company called power ledger yes we're an australian technology company we use the blockchain to facilitate the trading of electricity and renewable energy certificates. Yes. We um, have projects in nine countries, including in Austria with Energy Steiermark and in France with Equateur. Yes. Uh, uh, the Equateur project will go live later this year and is around provenance tracking so that consumers can specify renewable energy from a particular generation source, like a, a particular solar farm in a particular interval. Um, in the US, we have a project for trading renewable energy certificates. There's a large market there and also virtual power plants here in Australia on the, the NEM. Uh, and I think that that is the kind of really beginnings of more sophisticated market mechanisms that can deliver uh -huh. the right physical outcome in the electricity market. So it's been very interesting hearing the comments here about whether markets are real or not or the extent yes. to which markets are facilitated but yeah, I think that the, the um, basket case situation that we find ourselves in in Australia in, from too much renewables can actually be um, assisted with technology that can um, put a market mechanism in to encourage the right physical outcomes as opposed to how it's been for a century where the physical system was built how it was built and then yep. the market sat on top of it. So it's a kind of, you know, reinvention of, um, how you know the system is um, being contemplated. Yes, but you can probably say this in the most competent way. Can you really uh, connect millions of people with uh, blockchain technology? Isn't that too much computing power at the end of the day? Oh, you could connect trillions of people. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, no, because yeah, if I, mean, I understand it, each person or each participant gets the full information, you know? And, and well, that, course, that is one type of blockchain. Yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. So there's many types of blockchain, uh -huh. blockchains, and, and there's proof of work blockchains, proof of stake blockchains, and some of them are more energy intensive and some of them require that every node ca um, carries with it the entirety of the information on the chain. This is but how I understood. Not, yeah. Mm, yeah, but there are many different types. So you've got like a... Ah consortium blockchain where you might just have the utilities that are using that recording the information of the market Between, um, yeah. as opposed to every single person yes. in that market yes as well and there's very interesting innovations happening even on that front where information is what they call hashed so that it's not the entirety of the set of data it's a kind of encryption of it so you can it actually has less some um, kind of so uh, you basically you have like blockchain nodes and in each mm -hmm. node you have customers connected in a relatively conventional mm -hmm. way. That, that makes Correct. a lot of sense for me, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. You're starting to see different kind of conceptions of blockchains for different purposes. And mm -hmm. um, some of them, you know, depending on, uh, you know, the market that they're serving and the requirements for them, there's different kind of needs for, for different types of um, functionality. Yeah. And I could imagine that the very nature of our renewable energies, you know, which allow feed in at different times and variable and so on, this could be very well handled with a blockchain type of technology. So there it would be well, a real advantage. The, you know, the, the benefit of a blockchain, I think, for electricity markets is it allows for um, direct trading between buyer and seller without an intermediary. Yeah. Yeah. But the settlement of payments as well um, as a part of the transaction. So in the case of like a battery um, selling electricity peer to peer, Mm -hmm. um, the output of the battery and the consumption of the electricity from that battery um, measured by smart meters becomes an entry in the ledger on the blockchain. But the creation of that entry and the payment are one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so that you actually create a real time trading and settlement environment. And in the case of virtual power plants, cross retailer trading and settlement. So you might have multiple retailers that are accessing the batteries of other retailers customers oh, yeah. and um, uh, performing an off market transaction that's reported into wholesale markets and in doing so um, uh, the customers receive payment that same day or the next day as opposed to every two months when you get billed huh. and i think that's quite an exciting proposition um, from a user experience perspective uh, and also Having that market mechanism means that households or even commercial and industrial users of power with batteries could pay back their investment in the battery faster by using a mm -hmm. virtual power plant. But a virtual power plant powered by a blockchain means that you could have many more buyers and market participants in that trading environment. And more buyers and sellers is a more sophisticated market and more market opportunities in, in australia this is being implemented already yeah. yeah so we have a partnership so far with four retailers on the national electricity market ah. we've only announced one so far we're building out that functionality with the one first and we've so far partnered with um a german battery company you might have heard of called sonnen sonnen of course yeah sonnen <laughs> is well known yeah, yeah. Uh, who are owned by shell and um, they have a really great demand response layer integrated into the inverter. Mm -hmm. And um, the first market we're focused on in the NEM in Australia is in South Australia because that, they have so much wind uh, and that the market is highly volatile, mm -hmm. which is obviously bad, but from an economic yeah. Yeah. opportunity perspective is fantastic. Um, and so we're starting off with spot market trading and adding um, uh, what we call FCAS, which is frequency and control and then so grid service trading as well. And there's huge economic potential and income earning potential for households with batteries to tap the FCAS market. Huh. Uh, this sounds well. really, really exciting. So we need to devote another complete session to the issue of blockchain introduction for renewable energy. Uh, Roger, I, I saw your hand uh, up a moment ago. You want to comment on this? I, I, have, a, I have a very yeah. unpolite question about blockchain. Go on. But by me, it's a moment to ask very unpolite questions. Yes. <laughs> I have the impression that's the same difference between going to the cash desk at the supermarket, this is traditional way, and going to the self-scanning uh, cash desk, and you have to self-scan yourself. But at the end, there is still a, a company who is managing the transaction, like the, the, the supermarket company or like the self-desk company who is, who is managing the the, the the thing if you sell you over your excess of electricity or you if you, to a to an electrical company or to a trader who is normal we make you a, a, every month a, a, a bill or maybe more more frequently or if you do this with your neighbor uh with blockchain it doesn't mm -hmm. change you have somebody who earn money or to uh, by with managing the transaction and the transaction is transaction cost it's only a new Participant of the participant of the market, and it has a 
Well, if it's more efficient, it could win, but I have some doubt that it's more efficient because it's not very interesting to get 15 times a day a mail with the new uh, five, pe five cent transaction on your electricity. <laughs> and, uh, I never heard uh, really the, 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 Blake, uh, the blockchain community explaining me concretely the use for the normal peoples. And this is, this is my problem. Okay, I, yeah, I think that's a great question, Roger. I don't think it's an um, uh, impolite question and I will do my best to explain it concretely, as you say. <laughs> um, so um, I think that if you have a normal virtual power plant without a blockchain, what you'll probably find is you'll have one retailer offering VPP services to its customers or one battery manufacturer offering VPP services to um, the owners of those batteries in the market. Uh, and it might be that that battery manufacturer could offer some cross retailer trading, but you're not gonna have cross battery manufacturer trading and cross retailer trading. And you could have an intermediary, like a market um, settlement, um, uh, like a, a stock exchange or a, you know, a, a wholesale market operator that, that could, could do that. And we obviously have wholesale markets that exist in the, in the world, but they're not really geared up to, um, to incorporate lots of small users in a low cost fashion. Participating in those markets is high cost. The participants have to put up credentials. The settlement varies from one week to you know, 90 days. Um, and there's things called like unders and overs as well. So there's the kind of true ups that have to happen through the reconciliation process. Using the blockchain, it's possible to connect like literally hundreds of thousands of small participants in a very low cost fashion underwritten by the retailers. So the, um, that for the retailers that would like to allow their customers to do this, they can do that in a low cost fashion. So the retailer gets access to that battery sourced electricity with a low transaction cost associated with it. In contrast to the costs associated with them participating in a, in a wholesale electricity market and also provide greater value to their customers and endear them and create a more sticky relationship with them. So I so think there's two elements to it, just yeah. to summarize. The ability to have cross pro, uh, battery product and cross retailer trading and settlement where none of the main battery manufacturers can do that because they only want to sell their own product and each retailer really only wants to um, offer it to their customers. And so you do need uh, an independent um, organization to do that. And they'll either do it in a cheap way or an expensive way, or they'll design the market in a, you know, in a cumbersome way or an agile way. And so, yes, you're right. There has to be somebody. Uh, 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 but the way that the block, what the blockchain does is facilitates that in a, in a efficient way, in a low cost and agile way. Wow, this is a powerful message. As a matter of fact, I think, Roger, we are learning here something which we are not yet aware of. I find it very fascinating that you now go ahead in Australia and really putting it into the practical world, you know, and I think we will hear very quickly uh, the most exciting uh, part of it would, of course, not be just replacing the cash cashier by a, a card carrier a cashier, but really enabling things which would not be possible with the old cash carrier, you know, and this is exactly what you're indicating. It could make things like implementation of batteries more interesting than they were without this type of um, availability of financing and payment system. Okay, we are running out of time. I had uh, very little time to discuss with Andrew, but Andrew, uh, are you still there? Because I see only your beautiful mountain picture. Uh, have you been aware of these efforts of uh, introducing blockchain technology in Australia or it has not touched for you? Uh, I've certainly been aware of it. Um, it's very far from my uh, skill set. So I've been uh, a remote observer like you. Ah, yeah. Okay. So I think... Okay, I have some idea actually yes. because, uh, because we didn't have opportunity to listen to Gemma so much. And uh, on Friday, we have our Australian session. Oh, yeah, 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 that's right. Uh, 6, Actually, 6 a.m. Uh, Brussels time, which, uh, and uh, Andrew is also joining us. So would you be able to join us, uh, Gemma? 
Oh, yeah, awesome. that, that would be amazing. <laughs> I um, I didn't know there was an Australian party happening without me. Yes. And actually, uh, Thomas, I would even invite Gemma for our women uh, session because, you know, you're a women CEO, so you would be a very good... In, uh, in, uh, we start in one hour, actually. In, in one hour from now, Gemma, would you in be available? Hour. Yeah. Um, yeah, I should, I should be able to do that. It is... It's, well. It'll Don't forget, she needs to she, she needs to get dressed. Uh, I mean, one hour is a little for <laughs> <laughs> No, because actually it's a very important initiative. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think really you are such an outspoken, uh, energetic person. I, I I think you should be there. Oh, thank you. I... Uh, let, let me just uh, put yes. the link to the. <clears throat> Let me, yeah, let me first thank you all for our session. We, we are missing some speakers, but I think we had no problem at all. And I think the topic of convergence of technology, we only could look at it from a few angles, uh, the hydropower, the blockchain technology, and the integration of batteries. But of course, it's very clear that without this convergence, uh, nothing could happen. So if you would not have, for instance, uh, AI and other technologies available for our smart grids, we could not integrate so huge amounts of uh, renewable electricity. And maybe sometime in the not too far future, we will say without the blockchain financing model, we would not be able to really get the, <laughs> uh, complex tradings, which we need uh, organized in this way. So I think we have learned here something. Roger is not yet nodding as <laughs> actively as Andre, but <laughs> I, I very good. Dog, <laughs> maybe I will learn I can it. hear a dog barking. Yes, oh, this was our filly, our dog, yes. <laughs> so thank you so, so much. And uh, I think this session will be as well available on YouTube. So if you have friends whom you want to say, oh, if you are questioning what blockchain is all about, have a look at this video, <laughs> which we have. And, and those who would like to learn more, you know, in... Uh, more deep so we will invite for friday yes to meet yes you yes okay yeah, so i will send you invite by uh, by uh, email but here there is a link uh, for our uh, empowering women today in one hour from now very good thank you, thank you, thank you so sorry much. for keeping